This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make lightning protection easy. If your wind turbines are due for maintenance or repairs, install our Strike Tape Retrofit LPS upgrade at the same time. A Strike Tape installation is the quick, easy solution that provides a dramatic, long lasting boost to the factory lightning protection system. Forward thinking wind site owners install Strike Tape today to increase uptime tomorrow. Learn more in the show notes of today's podcast. Welcome back. I'm Alan Hall. I'm Dan Blewett, and this is the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about wind energy, engineering, lightning protection, and ways to keep your wind turbines running. All right, welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, we're going to talk a lot about our great oceans. First, we're going to start with uh, not wind energy, but tidal power, uh, the Orbital O2, which is just a super cool tidal power generator, uh, two megawatts just getting deployed now into the Orkney Islands. So we'll chat a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about um, offshore wind and, and in respect to hurricanes. So this is something that I was thinking about a lot recently, did a bunch of research for today's show, um, because as wind power continues to you know, gain traction in the U.S. in the offshore market, you know, the U.S. is a pretty favorable environment for typhoons. So we'll talk today about a lot of the engineering challenges and just the unpredictable nature of installing offshore wind farms in the U.S., a lot of which might be in the way of Hurricane Alley. So Alan, first, let's start with uh, the Orbital O2. We were just checking out this YouTube video of the launch of this thing. It's like the size of a 747. It looks super well built. It looks very cool. I'm pretty impressed by it. What are, what's your take here? It is cool looking. It's enormous in size. It's hard to get a perspective on it until you, because it's when you see it in the water, it doesn't have any scale <laughs> to balance it off of. But when you see it mounted to the, the shipping truck or whatever you call the moving vehicle, what all... I don't know. There must be a hundred wheels on this thing. It's it's massive. It's really it's really massive. Uh, it's interesting, but it, isn't it? I know that there's been a lot of discussion about wave technology and some tidal stuff uh, over the last twenty years that I ever can recall. But this is going in a slightly different direction, where it's a purposely designed vehicle for a particular spot in the world. I think that think the tides there are pretty strong. And the and the just the movement of the water there is pretty strong, and and what do we say it was? Uh, how many megawatts was it going to be a peak power? Was it? It's two two mega two megawatts. Yeah. So it, we're we're going to put uh, some some photos up here on the YouTube version. But in case you're listening at home, this basically looks like if you imagine a you know seven forty seven or a Airbus. Uh, Alan, you're going to crucify me for this before what a a three twenty? What's the equivalent of a seven forty seven? Well, a there's 380. One. 380 right, is the big right. one, right? A very big aeroplane. <laughs> if you imagine a very big airplane uh, with a yellow fuselage. So the you know the whole center passenger section is uh, yellow with two. I guess like it's not like a gray, but it's like a pretty dark bluish gray. Uh, two set of honestly sets of wings, and the mm. reason they're wing shaped is because they hinge on the body so they can lift them up and do repairs you know even with the water i wouldn't say they're getting above water it doesn't appear that they do but then it will lower them down under the water where then they can generate their power so this wing design is really interesting because then it it prevents the need for divers to go down and make repairs they can just lift them up to the surface do the work they need to do and then push them back down below so using hydraulics so pretty cool. And basically they just tow it out to where it needs to be. And then they chain it into place and the rotors can reverse. So when the tides are going one way, it'll generate power. When the tire tides are going the other way, the blades will just uh, reverse and it'll continue to generate no matter which direction the tide's going. So yeah, one megawatt in a cell on each wing and uh, for a total of two megawatts each. I couldn't find the, the cost of this thing. Um, this one article compares it to the cost of the Shiwa power plant over in uh, somewhere in Asia. And that's that's a completely different system. It's like a wall of, of, uh, of tidal generators where they're using um, restricted water flow that then flows down, goes through them and produces power. That one was the cost of 298 million. 
this is vastly, vastly cheaper than that, but I can't find an exact estimate. But, um, I mean, Alan, do you, do you feel like you'd see these kind of intermixed with an offshore wind farm? I mean, could there be a hundred, you know, wind turbines and 50 of these kind of thrown in between? I mean, Oh, sure. I, I think anything like that is possible, right? It's because tides are well known and we know what the forces are involved there and we know they're coming in and out every day so it's pretty yeah. easy to calculate when you're getting power and how much you're going to get i think though the wild card is they're deploying this up in the north sea right orkney islands up in the north sea which is some really violently turbulent waters and it's i think until you do it you're never really sure it's kind of like watching the guys uh, all the crew at the ocean cleanup when they put their demonstrator out to the ocean and then it struggled to capture anything and it was breaking apart. And you, you just can't model a lot of what happens in the ocean in the lab or on a computer. You just have to do it. And I think this is what this is about right now. If it, if this uh, first uh, quote unquote demonstrator works, then they'll start making ones right behind it. But you, you have to put something in the water to, to see how it's going to fare. Yeah. Well, and you, you and I were talking about this off, off camera is that this isn't like some really tiny, like 200 <laughs> kilowatt demonstrator. This thing is the real no. deal. I mean, two, two megawatts yeah. is getting small by, you know, on, onshore, even by onshore standards, but still two megawatts sure. is, is nothing to scoff at, right? It's oh, no. especially when it's totally harvesting not. something that's completely unharvested, right? It's not like this is, you know, if you have a two megawatt wind turbine in place where you could put an eight megawatt, then you're like, man, we should maybe tear this thing down and quadruple our power. That might make sense. Right. Whereas in this in this case, it's just extra, and it's a significant amount. Two megawatts is again not nothing. Well, left. it's still scalable, right? I, I assume that the design is always just like in wind turbines. The design is going to be somewhat scalable, so it goes from yeah. two to four to Halley eight, <laughs> twelve megawatts, all of a sudden. Yeah, because yeah. if if the basic fundamentals are there, you're just increasing in size. I know loading and things get to be a little more difficult, but that's essentially what you do. You're just going to make it bigger. <laughs> yeah, bigger wings. And and the right. the turbine tips, I think, are 20 meters, so not gigantic, which it seems nice because it's not going to have to sweep as big of an area um, right. and not be in quite as deep a water to work just fine so pretty interesting we'll link to that youtube video that shows through is definitely definitely worth a watch it's really interesting even if you're not even if you're just so into wind that you just don't want to be on water side it's really cool <laughs> engineering I'm, I'm pretty impressed by it so let's move on um new report says that global that globally we might need five hundred thousand more workers this is a um analysis from the Global Wind Organization and Renewables Consulting Group and uh, the Global Wind Energy Council. So half a million workers, Alan, does that seem right between 2021 and 2025? If the offshore wind it happens like we think it's going to happen, then yeah, because there's multiple countries invested in offshore wind from UK, South Korea, United States, both the East and West Coasts and Gulf of Mexico. Everybody <laughs> is talking about it's like masses of numbers of wind turbines offshore and, and Brazil will, you're right. You're just going to see this, uh, Australia is going to do it. You, so you're going to see this massive number of wind turbines pop up because the restrictions are going to be less than on, on land, I think. Well, I got to, I got to clarify. This is half, this is half a million globally for all wind, not just offshore. Right. So offshore and onshore. Right. Yeah. But I think that the push is going to be offshore, right? And just the number of people you're going to need to manage all those wind turbines is going to be huge. Uh, 500,000 technicians seems almost undoable. It just, it's just a massive number of people. That's like a decent sized American city. <laughs> Right, it's like the size of Omaha, Nebraska is gonna learn how to to work on wind turbines. That seems not doable. Well, <laughs> so I mean that's started. true, but doesn't Amazon employ now over a million people? Didn't they add? Yeah, you like know, a quarter million last summer over the pandemic. I, I think right. I think it's actually more than that. I was listening to of all things a podcast last night talking about Amazon adding employees during the pandemic, and I think it was close almost f over 400,000 that, that were added. That sounds right. Yeah, that, that, that's a lot of employees in a short amount of time. But here's, I think here's a difference. Working on a wind turbine is a lot more challenging physically and 
sort of mentally that's the, the technical aspects safety, of it. Safety, all that stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. safety, right? All those you got to be in some sort of fit condition to do those things. Versus, you know, not to say that working in an Amazon warehouse is easy. It's not easy, but just there's different. a lot less, different work, a lot less sure. things. Right? It's a lot less training involved, a lot less uh, physical lifting and that, that kind of thing. So it's easy to sort of think about okay, Amazon, which is a huge employer, picking up four hundred thousand people to operate the warehouses because the grocery stores are shut down, which is essentially what happened. And, but it takes a while to get trained to be working on wind turbines. That's not an immediate thing. That's where I think the, tr the, the problem is going to be is just getting people to go, th go, th go through all the training. That's what's going to be the difficulty. So moving on, let's talk about our hurricanes. So obviously there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> you know, coastline, you can build wind turbines off in the U.S., right? So it's not to say that all these new projects are going to be at risk because, you know, the vast majority probably won't, you know, California, no problem. Upper Northeast, very unlikely that you'll get a, a major storm. You know, I grew up in Maryland, um, here in DC. I'm not sure we ever had a, I'm not sure if we ever had a major like landfall of a hurricane. You know, we get, we get like the tropical depression stuff, you know, where it's already mm. dissipated, comes up here, we get a lot of rain, right. et cetera, right. et cetera, maybe a little flooding, but it's never like a, a hit, but you know, down on in the Carolinas and then obviously south of that and then the Gulf of Mexico, pretty sure. significant risk. And those are, I'm sure, going to be looked at as possible sites in the future. And, we, you know, we report on, um, what was it, Virginia, Maryland, and one of the Carolinas were working to sort of build an alliance to bring factories to the area and all that stuff. So, right. <laughs> you know, you, you think some of these states would want the economic development and the jobs and all that stuff, even if there's, you know, a, a mild hurricane risk. So, Alan, I mean, what what's just your gut reaction first before we get into some of the, the numbers here and some of what some of the researchers have said? I mean, do you feel like this is going to be a problem? And, and for you as an engineer, as you talked about things not being proven in real life, we haven't really seen a wind farm get hit by a hurricane, have we? I think we have. It's been the question of what's the amplitude of the hurricane, right? And then, especially off the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, where uh, offshore, uh, it, over the water, there's been a lot of Category 4s and 5s, but as it approaches land, they tend to decrease a little bit, so they tend to be Category 3s and 2s, thank goodness. Uh, but out in the water, they tend to be where all the energy is stored and how those storms really get rolling. <laughs> the energy is much higher. So you could have, in theory, a category five or five plus out in the in the water where the turbines are. You know, they ha they've had the issue with oil rigs getting damaged in hurricanes, uh, really damaged in hurricanes. Uh, and then we've really haven't done seen so much in terms of wind turbines getting getting hit and really high ones and right and especially in the quantity of wind turbines we're talking about providing power for large sections of states uh, so your risk goes up as your dependency on those wind turbines goes up and, and that as the size of the wind turbines goes up i also think you have this sort of scaling problem where shorter wind turbines are going to be seeing kind of straight line winds but as you get taller the winds versus the altitude, the speeds are not the same. So you can get some really odd twisting forces going on on the on the turbine, which is maybe not designed for that. And we don't know. <laughs> so the only way to find out is to build them, stick them out there for a little while, and see what kind of load you're getting. And I, that's that's the scary part. If we if we skip the trial stage or seeing what's out there before we plant a bunch of turbines in high hurricane risk areas boy that just seems like trouble it's like it's like having an ice storm in texas you know it's going to be that sort of scale of uh oh what do we what what happened well and so some of the lessons learned from hurricane katrina and harvey so harvey had much less of an impact on oil rigs right than katrina did katrina destroyed 50, almost 50 of them and, yeah. and damaged a lot more than that um, and one of the major things they did after Katrina was that they raised the recommended minimum height of the decks from 71 to 90 feet. And wow. basically what they learned was a lot of the, the damage was from waves more waves, than wind yeah. or, or rain. And sure. so they recommended raising them up. Um, and of course, like, so one of the things I was reading was this, this twisted jacket foundation by Keystone Wind, 
one of theirs and, and they they tout that one of their foundations got hit directly by Katrina and was totally fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and those foundations, I guess, are one of many that can be used for wind turbines. But to me, even if the foundation is intact, I mean, you see what happens to trees in these in, in these hurricanes. <laughs> Yeah. They're just bending. I mean, as far as they can go, they get uprooted. Now, obviously, a wind turbine is not a hurt. Is not a not a not a tree. It's very well built. It's made of structural steel, and they're going to be you know even more well bolstered to be out there in the ocean, especially in like these sure. high risk areas. But sure, you just have to wonder when it's unproven, like what what weak what weak link Mother Nature might be able to find, whether it's. <laughs> You know, you look at, uh, yeah. there's a good article on Recharge News about GE's, some of their prototypes for new deep water floating wind designs. And you start talking about these undersea cables, you know, tensioning these floating bases and all those different base designs. And you wonder, like, where's the one weak link in there that could snap when this is in hurricane um, winds and hurricane waves? It only takes one eyelet of a cable to snap and the whole thing's maybe gone, right? And you'd probably build in a lot of redundancy, but sure. it just seems like a really interesting, and I'm not, <laughs> it just seems like a really interesting problem to solve. Like it, it's really, it looks a really, really hard problem to say we can be confident oh, putting sure. out a hundred of these in the, in the Gulf of Mexico that we're pretty sure they're going to stand up now. I mean, the insurance implications are really important too, because if these, if, you know, if the only hur- hurricane that could, that could destroy these potentially is a category four or five and they only come around once every 12 years that area or the likelihood it hits is well you know then it might not matter or or if it's every 20 years it might not matter right 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 i mean do you you feel like the the insurance and probability standpoint is probably a pretty (laughs) big piece here right right so the insurance companies are going to drive the design because when they start reviewing it and you get uh, dnv involved and looking at designs and assessing risk and which they're evolves into paying insurance, uh, that's where the engineers and the insurance people start to fight a little bit because, uh, you know, you're adding cost and complexity to a system to lower the cost of the insurance. And it happens in the airplane market, too. There's a lot of markets built like that. So the insurance adjusters are looking at the probability of this thing going over and having big pickouts, and the engineers are trying to keep the cost down and make something that's producible. So mm-hmm. they collide in the middle a lot of times, and you you go well, okay. I'm not, I'm not sure any. I'm not sure either side is right. Every everybody's protecting their own territory, and and the only way to know in this kind of situation where you're talking about extreme conditions on the planet Earth is usually to put something out there and to try it. But we just haven't really done it to that level yet. Especially with such such tall turbines. There have been turbines out in the water for a while. The question is, as they get 12 megawatt, 13 megawatt, 15 megawatt, 20 megawatt, and that means the the size is getting bigger, do we have the capability of keeping them moored? (laughs) I think that's going to be the question. Because if you can imagine, if they're floating wind turbines and they do break loose, that's bad news. Like, where's this thing going, right? Uh, does it run into a, it's got to run into land at some point, you know, and what kind of destruction does it do? Does it run into another turbine? Those things are just like inconceivable right now uh, on the, on the risk side. If, if you're an insurance company, you're just, you start going through the odds of this and like, oh man, that's a huge payout. I'm not sure we want to write insurance for that. So I'm going to make these engineers design it better. That's, that's more likely where everybody is at right now. Well, you also have to wonder, uh, so one of the books I've been reading recently is Noise by uh, Mm. Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning um, researcher. And he talks about just the difference between underwriters is vast. Like if you get, you know, John, the the underwriter or Steve, the underwriter, and you give them the exact same thing, one could say it's this and the other one could be off by 20 percent 30 percent people in the same in the same building working for the same company have vastly sure. different and obviously it wouldn't just be one person but even then you, the variability between companies could be enormous and there just is a lot of noise that's his point in the book where some of these you know what where can we apply algorithms sensibly <laughs> And where can we automate some of these things to eliminate? You know, that's one of the examples he discusses. Another one is our law system with judges. 
that you get a recommendation of six to 12 years. One judge gives you 11, one judge gives you six for the same crime, like very, very similar cases. And you're like, that yeah. shouldn't happen. Um, it, so just trying to eliminate some of that variability, which you imagine that's going to be a really big fiasco in offshore wind as well, because oh, you get one yeah. underwriter who's like, man, this seems really crazy. And one's like, oh, this is great. You know, and, and it has a favorable outlook and it could be a huge financial swing either way. Then again, I don't know how these things play out. So that's an outsider's <laughs> well, view, obviously. Is it is it like the U.S. housing market back in 2008, seven and eight, right? Where a lot of that was driven by essentially adjusters or uh, actuaries that were looking at what the risk was, a downside risk from lending people a whole bunch of money for a home with nothing mm -hmm. down. Right? It's, it's yeah. sort of that, but I can make a bunch of money right now. Uh, and there, there is a part of that of the economy which is in that mode, right? I'm going to put a bunch of wind turbines off. I can sell a bunch of insurance policies for these things um, and buy my boat. <laughs> and yeah. I'm going to be I'm going to be retired in Boca in 20 years when this goes wrong. Yeah, I mean that's that's part of it, right? If you watch if you watch insurance companies sort of ebb and flow over time you'll see those sort of things like ge's been taking a huge hit on some healthcare insurance they issued back in the 90s 80s and 90s with the can of loading mm -hmm. that that's just a big it's a big problem because you're talking about so much money and which yeah. is as, as each tournament gets bigger there's so much more risk for every single tournament it's what's going to happen well and you also wonder so a book I've m mentioned numerous times uh, from Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who talks about predictions and, and one of his books on fragility and anti-fragility, he just talks about a system being anti-fragile when it has lots of variability that can provide sort of a safety net. So example, if you had, right. if you made, if you made $10,000 a month in, you know, working for one employer, that's great. You might have some financial stability until you get fired, now you have $0 of income, right? Whereas if I have 10 $1,000 self-employed income streams, you can't knock all 10 of them offline, can you? It's not except for, right. you know, putting me in a coma, right. even then they might still work. So you right. wonder if that might apply here. So, it, you know, if you it, it does. Say, say they're putting a turbine, you know, wind farm with 100 turbines, I wonder if they would be interested in putting four different uh, foundation designs, you know, 25 turbines oh. all with four different foundations. Now, sure. something comes through, you know, if, they, if they're all well built, maybe none of them have any problems. But if there is a right. major storm, now you're pretty sure that not all of them are going to fail because of the same defect, if there was a defect, or if they just right. had something you overlooked. Now all 100 are at risk versus only 25 are at risk. And, the right. other, you know, and you might learn something too. If a hurricane that would have just wiped out any design, comes through and three quarters of all, you know, all of design A, B, and C are wiped out, but, but design D is remaining standing. Mm -hmm. Now you really learned a lot in practice. Um, right. So you wonder if they would employ anything like that rather than just roll out the exact same design, the exact same, you know, foundations for all of them. I mean, do, is that something that actually well, happens in practice though? Oh, sure. You see a lot of wind turbine farms. If you look at details of a particular farm, you may notice that it's the farm is split in two or three or four in terms of the the types of turbines, even the sizes of the turbines, and the manufacturers of the turbines will will vary. Mm -hmm. So you'll watch as they'll uh, create a new farm where the vast majority of the turbines are exi sort of existing technology, something that they know. But then yeah. there's always which four, smart. six, mm -hmm. eight. Right, it's totally smart. Then there's a couple at the end which are a different manufacturer, or a different size, or something new, or a direct drive, or something, and they're watching to learn what they how they operate in the field. And then they, if that looks good, they'll purchase more of them. So they use them as like a sampler system. I know it's hard to think about buying something so, so industrial, not scale as being like a yeah. little test platform for them, but that's what it is. Now, when we talk about some of the offshore wind things that are happening off the East Coast of the United States, where it's just one type of turbine and a lot of them, and they don't have a lot of service history, that's that's in risky. my opinion, yeah. is big risk. Now, it may mm -hmm. work, all work out, right? I mean, there's a lot of engineers working really hard to make it work, right? I mean, they, no one's thinking, I'm going to make this thing not work. But it's the unknowns that will only pop up through the lifetime that you hadn't thought of the day you're designing it. And mm -hmm. that's where your risk comes from, right? Is you got, if you're becoming so dependent on offshore wind, which my part of the world will be, 
than something cataclysmic like a hurricane coming up the coast, which has happened. Uh, we better be prepared for it because otherwise we're going to be like Texas in the ice storm, which we're, we're going to be really, really cold because most of my area is really cold the winter time. So it's going to be really cold for a number of days until they get something else brought online. And uh, it could be cataclysmic. You know, if you start playing out scenarios, you, you lose 100 large turbines off the coast of whatever state. You're, that's a lot of power you've just taken offline, yeah. and I'm not sure you could fulfill it easily. And in addition to replacing those turbines, oh. you have to also salvage and Months. What, d drag the other ones back to shore. I mean, yeah. that's a much sure. bigger salvage operation than an onshore one falling over or catching on fire or, <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Not just grab a crane. It's grab well, a bunch even, of boats. Go find it. <laughs> you know, go find it. <laughs> get, where's James? Cam where's J James Cameron? Like, we need, <laughs> that's a Titanic, we need a submarine. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, just think about the, all the underwater cables, right? So you don't even actually have to have a turbine a go point. flop over. As much as you sever some cables in the right mm -hmm. spots, it's going to be trouble, and it's going to be hard to to fix that. It's not a five minute repair like a telephone repair man fixing the line out front of your house you're talking about you yeah. know the waters off the coast of in my case massachusetts and it the, it's never great sailing out there anyway so i just think man that's the risks are much higher you're playing with you're playing with much higher risk offshore than you on onshore clearly yeah and so obviously like you know every wind turbine has the ability to to feather you know they can lock the blades at 55 sure. miles per hour yeah. Um, and they're going to have lots of different foundations. I'm, I'm, I'm also really curious just about the difference in foundations if, cause you know, you hear like in, in, I think Japan and like in California, like they're building skyscrapers with the ability to sway a little bit, right? Like they want to oh, allow sure. them to sway a little bit. So you wonder if right. some of that is built in here as well, where maybe oh, they yeah. could be like, Hey, we we're we're seeing a, a hurricane approach. Let's activate the hurricane system where it allows it to have more normal more than normal sway as it sort of just like battens down and more maybe acts like a buoy taking you know yes. sh let's shut down the blades it's just going to act like a buoy for the next three days till the storm passes <laughs> then they right. do something and it locks sort of locks back in place that could be really i mean again like i i just think there's like so it's a really fascinating engineering problem there's just i'm sure all these engineers i'm sure on it but there's just like a lot to consider about ways to mitigate this risk and a uh, lot of potentially variables. put them, yeah, put them in all these different places. And the other thing that's really fascinating and bizarre is that if you have enough wind turbines in the water, they can potentially greatly reduce. So Stanford did some research <laughs> showing that uh, a large, large amount, I'll get to that in a second, large amount of wind, wind turbines off the coast could reduce wind speeds by up to 50% and storm surges by up to 80%. And some other research also showed the same thing. But Alan, how many wind turbines does it take to actually have those effects? At least 20,000. 20, yeah. Stanford ran simulations up to 50,000. Wow. And this other, this other um, uh, research group ran up to 74,000. But And so mm. that, that's where it just becomes, like some of these researchers are like, yeah, let's put these out there. It's going to slow hurricanes down. 20,000? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for reference, That's I'm sure lot. many, yeah, I'm sure many of you out there listening know um, the size of some of these offshore wind farms, but the largest one at the moment, Horn C1, uh, which is largest by megawatt capacity at 1,218, is uh, only 174 turbines. So that, the world's largest, times 20, won't quite mm. get it. Well, that would get us there. That'd be 34,000. <laughs> um, okay, so. Wow. Wait, no, I did that math. Times 200. What's wrong with me? Yeah. Times 200, right? Yeah, 200. So we only need 200 more of the world's largest wind farm to slow these hurricanes down. That seems, yeah. I mean, how unrealistic is that? <laughs> well, like we talked about earlier, we need a whole bunch of workers just to, to operate those things and maintain it. But I'm not sure we would have it. And if you think about how much energy is stored in a hurricane, you know, it's not in terawatts. It's it's got to be whatever whatever comes after terawatts in terms of the amount of potential energy that's or kinetic energy. It's it's in a, one of those storms because they're so massively big that you're you're just tapping a little bit of it, right? Trying to mm -hmm. suck some energy out of it and make it into electricity. But it's it's like uh, the downside risk is so big that it's not really worth it. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah, and that that second battle research was by University of Delaware. So, yeah, I just and, and the other thing is you wonder what happens if you stop a hurricane with so many wind turbines out in the ocean. Is does that have some other effect? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe this is just something where it just <laughs> you know like a just like a a wind rushes through a forest and the forest dampens the wind, right? Maybe it has sure. no effect, but maybe it could have some like weird effect where <laughs> the earth is in some, I don't know, just like screw well, with Mother like a Nature. Break, right? How much can we screw with Mother Nature before she gets even angry at us? <laughs> I don't know. It's that to me seems, I'm, it doesn't seem like there's any issue with it, but it seems strange that we're Although just like stopping, her, stopping hurricanes. You know, there has got to be a downside. There's got to be a downside to anything you do. Right, so uh, uh, it's like having the forest fire, right? Oh, the forest oh, fires are bad, that. right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So, you know, I mean, there must be some sort of insect, creature, plant that depends on hurricane category five winds once every 20 years to repopulate itself or whatever happens there. So I'm not so sure slowing down the hurricanes is, you know... <laughs> There's a lot about nature we don't understand, and I don't know if I want to tinker with that way too much. Yeah. Well, the fire, the fire, uh, forest fires are a good example because they really do reset, like the, they reset the landscape in a lot of places, yeah. you know, like yeah. don't they, people burn fields and they've been doing it for a long time because it mm -hmm. replenishes some nutrients into the nutrients, field. Yeah. And yeah, like, so mother nature knows what's up well, and it's, no, and it's no. tested those things over years and I mean, hundreds of millions of years. So it's, they figured it out. Good job, Mother Nature. So, um, but anyway, couple pieces of housekeeping. A number one, if you're out there and you work in offshore wind and you have deep thoughts on any of the stuff today, we'd love to hear from you. So shoot us an email. We're definitely looking for guests in the offshore sector. So if you have any experience with, you know, whether you're a technician or cabling or you want to come talk to us about hurricanes, shoot us an email. Uh, links in the description. Also. We're starting a new newsletter for those of you who enjoy the show. It's called Uptime Tech News. It's not a corporate boring newsletter. It's just a once a week update on our newest show. So you get a link to it in your inbox. You'll get links to all the, the articles and videos that we discuss on the show and some other stuff that you want to stay ahead of if you're really you know on the forefront of technology in the wind industry. So we hope this is a really valuable newsletter to you. Um, so you can sign up for that in the show notes below. And... We hope to see that in your inbox uh, this upcoming week. So from Alan, all of us here at the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast, we will see you next week. Operating a profitable wind farm is all about mitigating costs, minimizing risks, and being efficient with maintenance, repairs, and upgrades. It's incredibly expensive to send a team of rope access technicians up tower to make even simple repairs. We also know how costly lightning damage can be, requiring inspection, repairs, and downtime for even minor lightning strikes. Maximize the time efficiency of your techs and prevent future lightning damage by installing our Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your crews are going up on ropes. Learn more in today's show notes or visit us on the web at weatherguardwind.com.